Uh, Melanie Stansbury uh, represents the 1st District of New Mexico. She previously served in the New Mexico House of Representatives. Before that, she served in the Office of Management and Budget, and she also has worked as a consultant at Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, given our committee oversight of the national labs, I think we will benefit greatly from her experience, and I look forward to having her on this committee, and I want to welcome her. Will you raise your hand so people know who you are? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now the hearing will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Before I deliver my opening remarks, I just want to say that since we are in person and virtual today, I am delighted. It's been a while since we've been here, and I hope that we will continue to expand as we move along. Uh, a couple of reminders, though. Uh, members and staff who are attending in person and are unvaccinated uh, against COVID-19 must stay masked throughout the hearing. Un unvaccinated members may remove their mask only during the question and answer of the five-minute rule. And you're on your own to make that determination. Uh, members who are attending virtually should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing and members are responsible for their own microphones. So please also keep your microphones muted until you are speaking. And finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. We have, um, we've done that. Uh, we want to say welcome and um, and welcome back to our administrator. I look forward uh, to working with him, and we're all delighted uh, that we have a person that is familiar with the work of the committee and especially the work of space. Uh, Senator Nelson served on our committee. In fact, he chaired the space subcommittee for six years, during which time that he flew into space. Uh, about abroad, uh, the National Space Shuttle Columbia. And now we welcome him back today to testify before our committee as a national NASA administrator after a distinguished career in both the House and Senate. We look forward to his testimony and welcome again. It is no secret to our colleagues that I am a strong supporter of NASA. It is one of the crown jewels of our nation's R&D enterprise, and equally importantly, uh, it is a source of inspiration for our young people, and indeed for people young and old around the world. Uh, and I'm a Texan, where President Johnson took the lead and heard the call from President Kennedy to keep going with it. Uh, because NASA uh, turns daring aspirations into reality, whether it is flying a helicopter above the dusty expanses of Mars or pushing the boundaries of aeronautics research here on Earth, working with 14 other nations to build and operate an international space station in Earth orbit, uh, building a fleet of spacecraft to monitor a challenging climate, or searching uh, for life elsewhere in the universe. I'd like to say that the Science, Space, and Technology Committee is the committee for the future. And I think that is equally true of NASA. The dedicated men and women of NASA are helping create our future in space and here on Earth. And they should take great pride in both what they have accomplished to date and in what they are striving to accomplish in the days and years ahead. Yet turning NASA's aspirations into reality will take more than determination or even good budgets. For example, to execute an ambitious national initiative like the Atomist uh, Moon Mars Initiative will require clear goals and objectives, thoughtful planning, realistic scheduling, and a creditable organizational and management structure, and attention 
to the multitude of details that spell the differences between success and catastrophic failure. And also critical uh, to the success will be finding out as soon as possible where the problems are, they need attention. That is why I have argued that it is an early priority to carry out an independent review of the entire Artemis initiative so that you can take whatever corrective actions we need as soon as possible. The lessons of the past are clear. Failing to uncover problems before the arbitrary schedule of uh, pressure inevitably winds up costing more in both money and delays and increased risk. If Congress is going to be asked to provide increased funding, it first will need to have confidence in NASA's initiatives. Uh, and it is critical that we see a path to success. Another issue needing attention in the future of this International Space Station, it will not last forever. We need to know how long it will remain viably structurally and operationally. We need a clear plan for transitioning to what comes next. And we need to know what the future of the United States and its international partners in low earth orbit should be, especially given the reality of the new Chinese space station. I could go on, but as I said, these are very challenging times for NASA. However, make no mistake, the committee wants NASA to succeed. I hope that today's hearing will be just the start of a continuing dialogue and collaborations with you, Mr. Administrator. And with that, I want to again welcome you and look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes my outstanding ranking member, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And before I start, I want to thank you for holding this hybrid hearing and enabling members, staff, and Administrator Nelson to participate in person safely. After a year and a half of virtual hearings, I think I speak for the entire Republican conference when I say it's good to be back doing the people's business in person. So thank you, Madam Chair. Today's hearing is important and timely. For several years, NASA has conducted a review after review of human spaceflight program. Although the overall goal to return U.S. astronauts to the moon remains constant, NASA has changed its plans on how to accomplish that goal several times over numerous reviews. After numerous independent advisory groups like the National Academies of Science and the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel have highlighted, program stability is critical to ensuring overall mission success. As Administrator Nelson knows, Congress has provided this consistency for nearly 20 years following the Columbia accident investigation. The cancellation of the shuttle and the development of deep space capacities. Despite the ebbs and flows of each new administration's priorities, Congress has maintained a steady course for the nation's space program. That's why I was pleased to see that the Biden administration is continuing the Artemis program, keeping our sights on returning to the moon in a manner that enables exploration of Mars and beyond is paramount at this critical juncture. The Orion spacecraft was delivered to the Kennedy Space Center last year, and the Space Launch System was also recently delivered to Kennedy Space Center after a successful green run. It's exciting to see the SLS being stacked with boosters in the Vehicle Assembly Building as we speak. NASA's exploration ground systems are working diligently to receive, process, and launch these critical national systems. But more work remains. NASA's human landing system procurement is stalled by GAO protests. Everyone wants to get started on this critical piece of hardware, but we must first let the process play out and adjust course based on GAO's ruling and available funding. I look forward to working with our colleagues in the Senate and on the appropriations committees and in the administration to chart a path forward that enables the success of our space program. The largest unknown looming on the horizon is the budget. Finding an extra $10 billion for the human landing system is no easy task. While the Senate recently authorized an additional $10 billion and required NASA to select an additional contractor, if NASA doesn't get additional appropriated funding, this could become an unfunded mandate that could end up with NASA having to cut billions of dollars from other programs. I'm sure no one wants to see this happen. 
That's why it's important for NASA to propose realistic plans, budgets, and schedules, and not rely on Hail Mary passes to save the day. Other nations like China are making slow and steady progress and are following disciplined plans. We must maintain steady support for our national space program so that the new frontiers in space will be explored by free nations, not by oppressive regimes. With that, Madam Chair, it is wonderful to be at the dais with you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our witness. Uh, Senator Bill Nelson was sworn in as the 14th NASA Administrator, May the 3rd, 2021. He is no stranger to this committee and Congress, having chaired the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee for six years and later serving as a ranking member on the State Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee uh, in, the, in the Senate. He served in the House for 13 years and was later elected three times to the U.S. Senate, representing Florida for 18 years. Senator Nelson attended the University of Florida and Yale University. He received a JD from the University of Virginia. After law school, he served on active duty as captain in the US Army. He has served in public office over four decades in the state legislature as a state treasurer and in the US Congress. In 1986, he flew on Space Shuttle Columbia as a payload specialist, orbiting the Earth 98 times over six days while conducting research experiments. After leaving the Senate, he continued to be engaged in NASA activities, serving on the NASA Advisory Council until his nomination of the National Administrator. We are delighted to have him here today, Administrator, uh, Administrator Nelson, and we look forward to your testimony. Our witnesses should know you will have five minutes for the spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. And when you have completed your spoken testimony, we'll begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask the question. So now, Administrator Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if it looks like I'm smiling, I am. Uh, coming back into these halls brings back so many pleasant memories and so many cherished friendships. Uh, most of these portraits I have served with, uh, and uh, it, it's an outstanding committee. Uh, I want to uh, welcome the, the new member of Congress. And Madam Chair, if you're getting folks that are so uh, experienced, like your new member coming from Sandia, uh, again, it's just uh, an example of the reputation of the members of this committee to be a very uh, well-experienced and, and very serious committee. We're going back to the moon in preparation to go to Mars. And... Space is hard. Uh, a lot of people focus in on the date about 2024. We're going back to the moon with humans in 2023. It's going to be following the first launch, which is at the end of this year, 2021. The largest, most powerful rocket ever. The SLS space launch system. We are then going to hitch up with whoever is the winner of all the competitions after the GAO makes its decision. And we are in a blackout period now until August the 4th, when the GAO is going to determine uh, whether or not the bid protest is successful. All of this occurred before I was there, but I'm here to defend what NASA has done. But with regard to what's going forward, we're not going to know until August the 4th when the GAO decides. 
Pam Melroy, who I just uh, swore in on uh, Monday, now is with us as our deputy. Our number three in the agency is Bob Cabana, also an astronaut commander, as is Pam. Uh, he's long experienced uh, in the administration in Johnson, then the head of Stennis, then the head of Kennedy, and well respected. And the three of us are already trying to make the plans so that when the GAO decides that we can move out quickly, depending on what the GAO decides as a legal matter. Now, that's just the human exploration. Look what's already happened. Uh, what American is not excited about perseverance and little ingenuity flying around all over the Mars surface? Uh, again, a pinpoint landing. But remember, as the ranking member said, remember it was followed by only the second nation to be able to land a rover successfully. Uh, the Chinese government, the Chinese space program did that, and they have a very aggressive program. And uh, we got to beware of that. They're putting a series of landers on the south pole of the moon. So are we. It's called the CLIPS program. It's the C stands for commercial. We're going to go down there to the south pole. Why? Because there's water down there and it's frozen. And when you have water, that means you've got oxygen and you've got fuel, hydrogen. Uh, so... Both of our nations are going down there, but the fact that they are planning this, just beware. Look at what's happening in the earth science and the planetary science. We just announced uh, five great observatories that are going to go to Venus. We haven't been to Venus in 30 years. Why Venus? You think of it, the sun. The next planet is Mercury, it's hot. The next planet is Venus, and it's covered with a shroud of clouds. And that's caused it to heat up so much that it can melt lead on the surface. The next planet is Earth. It has a habitable atmosphere. The next planet is Mars, and it has a very thin atmosphere. Now, what is it about Mars and about Venus? Do they have the chemical compositions that they could have had life? Because after all, this universe has been developing for 13 and a half billion years. And I'll conclude with this, uh, Madam Chairman. Another part of our science, we're sending up in November, this telescope is going out of French uh, Guiana on an Ariane rocket. It's about a $9 billion telescope, and it is going to peer back to the light source 13.35 billion years. That's only 150 million years after the Big Bang, which is the beginning of the very cosmic systems. And we're going to be able to capture that light that has been traveling all those billions of years and find out things that we've never found out before. We found out a lot from Hubble, which is still up there trying to work. That's the excitement of what is going. And finally, Madam Chairman, Earth science. In every one of your pockets is that cell phone, which I forgot to turn off, and it has a camera that we all use. That camera is on a chip, and that camera was developed by NASA 
to observe the earth, to get the precision measurements because of what's happening to our planet. If you want to mitigate the climate, you got to measure. And that's what NASA does. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We now will begin our first round of questions and I will recognize myself for five minutes. Administrator Nelson, you have often discussed your concerns about China's ambitions and advancements in space. And it's clear that with sustained planning and, and methodical preparation, they have made steady and measured progress. They successfully landed on the far side of the moon. They have returned lunar samples to the Earth. They landed a rover on the surface of Mars, and they are establishing a small space station on low Earth orbit. And they indicated that they are planning for human landings and outposts on the moon. China clearly is in space for the long term. And we need to recognize that and respond accordingly. To me, that doesn't mean undertaking a crash program with unrealistic timetables, but it does mean that in human space flight, NASA needs to focus its efforts and develop a clear plan and program to achieve these goals set by successive administrations and authorizations namely return to the moon as necessary steps toward the ultimate goal of landing humans on Mars. NASA needs to develop that plan and program now because they aren't on limited resources and we really can't afford to pursue nice to have projects at the expense of neglecting essential tasks. To date, the committee has been has seen has not seen such a plan for the Artemis initiative. And it's not because we haven't asked for it. I am not blaming you because you just settled in NASA. But what can we expect to see? And when can we expect to see the plan of the program? And how do we get how are we going to get to Mars as well as what specifically we will need to accomplish? Uh, getting to the moon, uh, on the moon. August the 4th, Madam Chairman. Uh, once uh, we know the direction legally as a result of GAO, uh, I will have a plan to announce uh, according to what their decision is. Uh, in order to try to have us there as quickly and as safely and as efficiently as possible. Well, let's be realistic. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, uh, for example, what the Source Selection Board uh, uh, picking out of the existing uh, competitors. Uh, NASA had asked for $3.4 billion uh, for that competition. Uh, the award uh, uh, of appropriations was $850 million. And so the Source Selection Board, uh, back before I came in, decided that they didn't have enough money uh, and that they would award it to one of the three competitors. That award, uh, the concept is that NASA's vehicle, the SLS, with its spacecraft on top, Orion, will take the crew to lunar orbit. And then in lunar orbit, there will be the transfer of the crew into the landing vehicle, and that will go down to the surface. They'll do their mission, they'll come back, and then Orion will return with the crew to the Earth. That's one concept. 
There are other concepts to put up a gateway, which is a mini space station in lunar orbit, and that is being planned as an international station <laughs> that you will take the crew to that. They will then transfer into a lunar landing vehicle. So there are different plans. What was awarded was just for one demonstration. But there needs to be a landing each year for a dozen years. So there are many more awards to come if you all decide that it's in the interest of uh, the United States to appropriate that money. And of course, the appropriation starts right here in this committee with the authorization. So. Uh, that's uh, about as succinct as I can tell you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. My time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And continuing with the, the chair's uh, line of questioning, and I acknowledge the Chinese are making steady progress on their exploration goals, and I think it's very important we maintain our momentum. So in that vein, I ask you this, uh, Director, within the confines of what you've just discussed. Are you confident that the FY22 budget request, which has proposed reductions in the HLS program, are you confident that that's capable of getting us back to the lunar surface by 2024? And I'll go farther than that to say part of our challenge here in appropriations, even if we're successful, there's still that little creature called OMB, and there's still that process of uh, the administration uh, as pulling as we push. Uh, we need a little more push over there while we're pulling on this side. Do you believe the 2022 budget request is enough to do what we need to get done? And by the way, you can strike out 2024. Give me a number for a date. Um, Mr. Ranking Member, in your state and my state, we have an expression. Uh, there are more ways than one to skin a cat. So I've talked directly to OMB uh, about the additional money for us to have the robust competition that we want, to have these sustained landings over a dozen years. And that's going to cost some more money. So I've said uh, to them, well, you all are going to consider a jobs bill, an infrastructure bill. And by the way, I hadn't even talked about the desperate needs of, uh, of, of NASA on dilapidated uh, infrastructure, uh, which is also jobs. Uh, and so uh, if you all put together a jobs bill, that's another way of funding uh, otherwise, you look at the uh, the request, and that's your your question is the president's request. It is a very robust NASA request. It's over a six percent increase. And look at what's happened uh, in the increases in science, in STEM education, uh, in aeronautics. By by the way, we hadn't even talked about the first A in NASA, which is aeronautics. A lot of exciting things going there. Uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Along that line, NASA has a very vast portfolio of programs, and it's always challenging to keep all those plates spinning at once. I mean, I'm not sure the general public appreciates you've got deep space exploration, you've got low Earth orbit operations, you've got planetary science, astronomy, astrophysics, Earth science, heliophysics, biology, physical sciences, and aeronautics. Among many of those components... How are you going to keep all those plates balanced, Mr. Administrator? And I have faith in you. But that's a challenge with the dollars you have available. Well, I agree with you. Uh, but I'll tell you, why is NASA consistently thought of by the American public as the most popular government agency? And why does NASA have very little turnover compared to other agencies? It's because the people are, are so incredibly talented and because of the mission 
they're fairly happy. Uh, and so obviously I'm not doing this. It's they are doing that. One last question, Mr. Administrator. In your time in the Senate, you were an incredible champion of the development of the Space Launch System and the Orion spacecraft. Part of, of course, enabling long-term sustained exploration of deep space. And you advocated for using existing hardware facilities, workforces, smooth transition systems, all very logical. Do you envision NASA using SLS and Orion past the initial Artemis missions? In reality, yes, because Artemis is a program to go back to the moon, but that's just the goal is going to Mars. Uh, because once we get there, we're going to dig down into that regolith and hopefully in the meantime have a sample return mission. By the way, that's another thing that the Chinese government is trying to do uh, and is planning to do. Uh, and to see what happened to Mars. Is there still in that water? Is there any indication that there was life? So the goal is Mars. So the answer specifically on the SLS is it's going to be used as the workhorse, probably in lunar orbit, to then fashion together whatever this new technology that we develop to go to Mars is going to look like, hopefully faster than we can go now, which is eight to 10 months. By the time you get there, you got to be on the surface for a year or two because of the realignment of the planets in order to get back. If you can sprint there faster, you can stay on the surface weeks, a month, and then sprint back. But all of those technologies, we still have to develop. So yes, the answer to your question is the yes, the SLS will be a workhorse for the future. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. And I'd simply note, we on this committee, I think I can say in a bipartisan way, are going to pull as hard as we can. You're our guy in the administration to push as we pull. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Byer is now recognized remotely. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And uh, Senator Administrator, I, I really appreciate your coming. Uh, I apologize for the noise. I'm at the back of National Cathedral awaiting the, uh, the John Warner service. Um, but I'm really grateful to be moved up a little bit. Administrator, we're very supportive of the Deep Space Exploration Program as to, to Moon as a stepping stone to Mars. And you actually... Asked, answered my first question already with your promise after the GAO report on August 4th and your new timeline, but but I didn't actually ask the question, so let me at least get that out, out on record, that with the GAO report on the NASA lunar programs, they noted several, several challenges, that NASA's minimizing requirements for mission success for some programs, that Na NASA lacks top-level Artemis requirements and associated risks, the NASA is relying on key technologies that are still at very immature levels. The NASA hasn't defined management roles and responsibilities or documented decisions on management practices. The NASA demands the systems integration across divisions. And then in addition, the Aerospace Safety Advisory Council has identified concerns regarding systems engineering integration, lack of clear roles, responsibilities, accountability, especially for HLS. So are you sure you want this job? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, report was written before uh, some of the changes that had occurred. So uh, parts of that report are dated. And yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I really am, uh, am excited about this job and ready to tackle this challenge. And finally, let me say that John Warner was a uh, a special mentor to me. He was our chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and I grew to love him. And so uh, I'm glad you're there at uh, his funeral at the National Cathedral. And, and one more question in the few minutes, seconds I have left is, one of the big concerns will be on space traffic management 
and orbital debris. It even came up in the President Biden-Putin conversations. Um, we know that NASA has all the data they're measuring, but that you're not a regulatory agency. How do you see NASA fitting into the ultimate solution on space traffic management? Uh, NASA has to be involved because it's our astronauts that are at risk. Uh, you, you put up more junk like China did 10 years ago when they blew to smithereens a target uh, satellite when they were testing their ASAP. Uh, you put up junk like that, tens of thousands of pieces, then human life is definitely threatened in low Earth orbit, which is where uh, our International Space Station is. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, NASA is going to be involved one way or another. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're working on technology that will help us get those pieces of debris out and get them slowed down enough so that gravity will take over, bring them back in through the fiery heat of reentry that will burn them up. Uh, we work, of course, with the... Space Force used to be the Air Force that tracks all of the objects that are about that, that big or bigger. Uh, what I worry about are objects that are smaller. I remember we looked outside the window on our flight, this is 36 years ago, and there was a washer floating right along with us as I looked out the window. If, if something even that small were to hit, at a different angle on a space suit in a, in a spacewalk or, or even a window uh, of the ISS, it could be catastrophe. So NASA's got to be involved in space debris. Thank you, Mr. Madam, thank you, Chair. I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing today about uh, NASA's fiscal year 2022 budget proposal. Uh, Administrator Nelson uh, will help NASA remain a leader in our nation's future space endeavors, uh, including our deep space exploration program that will return American astronauts to the moon and beyond on American hardware. <clears throat> I'm also delighted that Administrator Nelson appointed NASA Kennedy Space Center's Director Bob Cabana to be the new Associate Administrator. Uh, and, and congratulations to you, uh, again, Administrator Nelson, on your unanimous confirmation uh, to your job. Uh, as a former Senator from Florida, you're keenly aware of the importance of NASA centers. In 2010, you were one of uh, the leading champions of using existing shuttle hardware workforce and facilities to develop SLS after the cancellation of the shuttle. Uh, your rationale at the time was to prevent an exodus of talent and smooth the transition from one system to another. Uh, while the Space Coast certainly experienced its share of hardship during that period of time, uh, we've seen significant progress made at the Kennedy Space Center in many areas. Uh, exploration ground systems are preparing for the first launch of SLS, and, and the center has adopted a multi-user spaceport approach to accommodate multiple commercial users, which many people never imagined could possibly happen uh, not that long ago. Uh, can you speak to what progress has been made and, and what you see for the future at the Kennedy Space Center and, and our human spaceflight program? Congressman, uh, my home congressman, uh, representing uh, the Space Coast, uh, and it's a place that I grew up. It's a place uh, that my grandparents under the Homestead Act in uh, the early part of the last century actually homesteaded, worked the land. And under the Homestead Act, if you work the land for four years continuously, uh, the government would deed you 160 acres. I have a copy of that deed signed by Woodrow Wilson to my grandmother. And that 160 acres today is at the north end of the space shuttle runway at the Kennedy Space Center. So thank you, Congressman, for your representation. The Kennedy Space Center 
and the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station has unlimited possibilities. The place is throbbing with excitement. All those old abandoned launch pads from the early days of uh, Gemini and uh, Mercury and Apollo and all the various other military missions, abandoned pads, they are coming to life. They are launching new rockets. In addition, it is, as you stated, a multi-use spaceport. Uh, and we are seeing the blending of the commercial operations along with the government operations, both military, intelligence, and civilian. Uh, and uh, I give you as much detail as you want, but it's an exciting future. And that's happening at all the NASA centers and facilities. Uh, take, for example, uh, Wallops, a launch facility in Virginia. Most of the people live in Maryland. Uh, it is uh, just exciting with all of the medium weight launches that they are doing from there. So there are unlimited possibilities all over the United States. Uh, with the recent, recent achievement of getting a core stage vertical and, and stack between the solid rocket boosters and the VAB, uh, has NASA been able to use that as a major milestone to help set a launch date for Artemis? Artemis is going to go in November. That's the, uh, that's the schedule. Okay. Uh, we know that space is hard and you don't want to do it uh, not in a safe manner. So it's always possible there's going to be delays. But by the way, Madam Chair, I think y'all ought to have a Codell to come down and see the most powerful rocket ever. This rocket is as tall as the Saturn V, but it puts a punch out of uh, much greater uh, liftoff thrust uh, than anything that's ever launched on planet Earth. Uh, thank you for your leadership, uh, Administrator Nelson. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas. Thank you, Administrator Nelson, for your leadership. We have the opportunity and the imperative to implement bold, comprehensive, science-based policies to address the climate crisis, and NASA can play an, an important role in that work. Earth science observations are essential for mapping and monitoring hazards from the climate crisis, including the drought conditions, extreme heat, and wildfires we're experiencing in the Pacific Northwest today. I'm particularly alarmed with a recent study from NASA and NOAA that found that the amount of heat the Earth traps has roughly doubled since 2005. So as co-chair of the House Oceans Caucus, I know that without bold action to address the climate crisis, the ocean will continue to take the heat for us and the warming temperatures as you know, uh, Administrator Nelson, are resulting in more frequent weather, uh, extreme weather events, ocean acidification, and the loss of biodiversity. So during your time and your tenure in the Senate, I'm, I'm grateful for your work to expand scientific research, monitoring, and adaptation measures for harmful algal blooms, HABs, and hypoxia. We've seen this issue in the, the warm blob off the Pacific coast in Lake Okeechobee in Florida and lakes and rivers across the country. Uh, we need more accurate information to help predict and mitigate HABs. So how can the PACE mission help accelerate our understanding of harmful algal blooms, and how can these observations contribute to the goals of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development? May I give you some additional information in addition to answering PACE? Yes, of course. I, I do have another question, so I want to leave time for that. Thank you, Administrator. You want to ask your next question? I'll No, I'll, I'll wait till your, your okay. response. Uh, first of all, you cannot mitigate uh, you cannot mitigate what's happening to the climate unless you can measure it. Correct. And we are uniquely situated. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, NASA, all of that, those assets up there, NASA designs them, builds them, launches them, and NOAA operates them. And of course, look at the accuracy uh, of weather predictions now, and it's going to get a lot better. 
because not only are we relying on the Earth sensing spacecraft that are up there now, over the next 10 years, we're putting up five great observatories. It's a two and a half billion dollar project over a decade. They're going to measure anything that is happening with the land, the water, the ice, and the atmosphere. And they're going to put together a 3D composite of all this information interrelated with all the other assets we have up there to help us fine tune our understanding of what is happening to our planet. Terrific. I look forward to working with you and Dr. Spinrad at NOAA on, on that important issue. Uh, thank you, Administrator Nelson. And I know NASA recognizes the need to invest in our next generation and also the importance of a diverse workforce. So this budget uh, would strengthen the Office of STEM engagement after the previous administration tried multiple times to terminate the program. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the STEAM Caucus and also a fan of Katie Coleman, the astronaut who played a flute duet from the International Space Station. So I want to recognize NASA for the recent partnership with LEGO Education to distribute STEAM curriculum because integrating the arts into STEM uh, curriculum has shown to improve academic outcomes and engagement and boost creativity. I urge the Office of STEM, STEM Engagement to continue developing similar initiatives, and I want to ask how, if you could please talk about how that Office of STEM Engagement will foster a future innovative workforce and also improve diversity at NASA. Thank you to the Congress that when it was zeroed out in previous budgets, you all always restored the education for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, what is happening is this particular proposed budget has a very robust increase in that. Every one of your congressional districts has a university or a community college that has got some STEM grants for students. It's especially, uh, now NASA is not the only agency that does that, but NASA is unique in our STEM projects because what gets kids excited about those subjects? Space flight. And so we are uniquely positioned, and that's why we utilize our astronauts so much, not just to fly in space and do all of the critical stuff, but to go out to colleges, universities, and high schools to talk to kids, to get them excited. And so we are really, uh, between Pam and, and Bob and me, we are really going to push STEM education. And uh, I think you'll be pleased. And again, thank you for restoring it every time it got zeroed out in the past. Thank you, Administrator. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. That was good news to hear, Mr. Babin. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Administrator Senator, uh, Administrator Nelson. Appreciate you being here. Um, President Biden's first budget, and you've already addressed some of this, but I, I just kind of like to get it on the record. His first budget request is $445 million lower than the Trump administration's last mm -hmm. budget request, $2.39 billion below what the Trump administration proposed for FY22, and $7.757 billion below the FY22 to 25 budget proposed by the Trump administration. The proposed cuts from exploration are very staggering. While the Biden administration expressed support for continuing the Artemis program to return U.S. astronauts to the moon by 2024, this year's request cuts $14.5 billion over the next four years from the Exploration Research and Development Account that would fund the human landing system and necessary lunar surface capabilities. Specifically, the budget request cuts $3.193 billion from the HLS budget proposed by President Trump for FY22 and a total of $10.05 billion from the Trump administration's FY21 request for HLS for the FY22-25. I know what you said about the old saying, because we have that same old saying in Texas, too. Uh, there's more than one way you can skin a cat. But just for the record, uh, are you saying there will be no, uh, no uh, uh, cuts of any programs 
in the program itself of, for Artemis because of these cuts? If we are the beneficiary of your uh, generosity, uh, there definitely won't be. Uh, remember what I said a few minutes ago. Uh, it was a $3.4 billion request for human spaceflight for the exploration part. The Congress appropriated $850 million. Uh, and so uh, you can only get so many pounds of potatoes out of a five-pound sack. Amen. Yeah. And uh, if you all are generous, whatever vehicle you use, and including the jobs bill, is an alternative, uh, mm -hmm. then we're going to try to rev it up. Mr. Mr. Right. Ranking Member. All right, sir. Thank you. Uh, in the late 90s, Congress passed the Commercial Space Act of 1992. This was before my time here on the committee and a little after your time. Uh, the law contained a provision called anchor tenancy that allowed NASA to enter into multi-year contracts for the purchase of a good or service if the administrator determines that the good or service meets the uh, agency mission requirements. The commercially procured good or service is cost effective. The good of our service is procured through a competitive process. Existing or potential customers for the good or service other than the United States government have been specifically identified. The long-term viability of the venture is not dependent upon a continued government market or other non-reimbursable government support, and private capital is at risk in the, in the venture. Has NASA specifically identified other customers for human landers or spacesuits uh, that would make these commercial ventures viable without NASA funding? We always value competition because you get the best product the most efficient way at the least cost. Uh, all those other procurement things that you just talked about, I don't know about those, but I'll find out. Okay. Uh, but I know what I just said is the goal. Yes, sir. Okay, number three, I think I still got time. I proudly represent the Johnson Space Center in Houston, home to Mission Control, the ISS program, and Astro Materials Acquisition and Curation Facility, and where the world's leading experts in spacesuits reside. You served as the chairman of the Space Subcommittee here in the House and represented the Kennedy Space Center in the Senate. Uh, so I am assured that you understand how centers play a unique role in your space enterprise. Can you give us assurance that NASA will not attempt to relocate, outsource, or degrade any of these world-class irreplaceable capabilities? Uh, remember, I looked at my role uh, in the Senate was I not only represented the Kennedy Space Center, I had to represent all of NASA and indeed have spent a good bit of time training at uh, the Johnson Space Center. And yes, I can give you uh, some information that'll reduce your heartburn. <laughs> uh, and indeed, uh, the, the spacesuit program is intended to stay at Johnson. Sounds good to me, Mr. Administrator. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Ms. Stevens is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Administrator, for uh, you're just very lovely oral testimony. I, I also uh, very much enjoyed your written testimony. And, and just for the record here, I, I want to quote the quote that you provided, which was in your conversation with our president on a phone call to, to NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The president said, we can land a rover on Mars. We can beat a pandemic. And with science, hope, and vision, there's not a damn thing we can't do as a country. And here we sit back in this room uh, with, with our Proverbs quote, where there is no vision, the people will perish. And so, Mr. Administrator, we are so grateful and blessed for your tremendous vision of NASA 
and uh, your understanding of the assets and the things that make it go round and that are going to continue to help our country to, to lead into the future. And even before the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, Mr. Administrator, uh, a 2020 NASA and Inspector General report stated that the U.S. industrial base is not as robust as it used to be, uh, making it difficult to find qualified technicians and suitable suppliers. Uh, could you tell me how serious of a problem this is for NASA and NASA's supply chain? And if you've thought about coming to Michigan to see our incredible supply chain assets where we brag, not only do we put the world on wheels, we are helping to send men and eventually a woman into outer space and, and the moon. Thank you. Ma'am, if you will invite me, I will be there. <laughs> Sounds uh, like a plan. <laughs> And I'm, I'm looking forward to going to many of your districts uh, because the, the strength of our country, indeed, that is reflected in an organization like this is out there. And your specific thing about uh, suppliers, uh, that's a huge strength. Now, we got to be careful because some of our supplies we are now dependent on of getting internationally. And some rare metals and materials uh, we are finding are in other countries that may not be necessarily friendly to us. That's a supply chain, not only for NASA, for the whole of government. But, uh, Let me just put it this way. If, if you think back, when we were challenged before and the Soviets took the high ground and they shocked us out of our wits with Sputnik and then with Gagarin first in orbit, and they even got Titov in orbit before uh, and we could only get Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom into suborbit. And then that all changed with John Glenn, who knew that he had a 20% chance of failure on that Atlas ICBM. And it worked. And then the nation said, we've got a goal. Uh, evoked by a very young and inspirational president, and we did it. And what happened to the country was extraordinary because we talk about STEM education. For generations, the excitement of achieving that goal not only rippled through our society in spinoffs, but also in science and technology and engineering and mathematics that led to the technological revolution that we are now beneficiaries of. Yeah. I suspect that what's going to happen, if we can get people really excited about us going back to the moon and on to Mars, that we're going to see a similar kindling of that excitement that will produce an educational revolution again. Sure. And, and we're certainly already seeing that diversification in a place where I call home, where the companies that produce the tubes that went into the auto engines are now producing the tubes that go into our rocket ship. So I gave him extra time to answer because I like listening to the administrator talk so much, but I will get back to you on questions for the record and yield back the remainder of my time. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Ranking Member, and uh, the Honorable Mr. Nelson for, for being here. Uh, and I do want to thank the, the Chair and Ranking Member for showing an example of how a committee should operate. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on this committee because we actually work together quite productively. Uh, so I, I appreciate their leadership. Um, Administrator Nelson, I have the pleasure of representing Northeast Ohio and, and the Glenn Research Center is, is just outside my district. I hope to host you there someday. Uh, and, and as you know, uh, they've been working hard on uh, the power and propulsion element uh, for Gateway uh, with their, their technology. And, 
and development in solar electric propulsion, uh, which will be demonstrated on Gateway and will be critical for future Moon and Mars missions. Gateway is also a key international partners to the Moon, uh, much as the much as the ISS has done for low Earth orbit. Uh, with the recent announcement from China and Russia on their active efforts to court international partners for their lunar research station, I believe Gateway is more important than ever. Uh, can you please discuss the budget request for Gateway uh, and how this request will keep Gateway on schedule to remain a key part of Artemis and how NASA will continue to partner with both industry and our international allies on Gateway? The budget request for Gateway is pretty good. Uh, and why Gateway? Because when you put in effect, a small space station in lunar orbit, then you can do a whole bunch of things in our preparation to go to Mars. Uh, number one, it becomes a way station uh, for us to go down to the moon and do all the things that we're doing down there. And all of that is necessary in the preparation of getting us able to sustain human life to go all the way to Mars and come back. Uh, but on Gateway, you can continue research in addition to what in the future will be commercial space stations in low Earth orbit that will supersede the International Space Station, which I hope will go on till 2030. And I request that of you, that you extend the life of the ISS to 2030. Uh, but Gateway will have additional research related to further deep space. But then what it does also, it allows us to prepare to go to Mars because it is quite likely that we would then, outside of the lunar space station, be the area where we would put together the components of whatever is the new technology that would take us as a spacecraft all the way to Mars and land with humans and return. So it's going to have a number of functions and it's important. Excellent. Uh, I want to shift towards auditing and China investments. I know this is a, a big priority of yours. You've shared repeatedly your concern about the, the rapid development of the Chinese space program and the challenges this will present to U.S. leadership. Uh, some of this includes China's efforts to work around our laws and leverage their investments into companies to give them additional insights, such as board observer seats uh, into technology being developed in partnership with the U.S. We've seen that across a number of industries, but in particular here. Uh, my question is, is, as we continue to invest more resources into NASA and other R&D agencies, how is NASA ensuring that new startups to the space market who are seeking government, government investment haven't already received funding from the Chinese government? Well, I certainly hope um, that we have the consultations with the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. Uh, I have been surprised. Uh, I thought I knew a lot about NASA coming in, but what I found out is we are much more involved uh, in understanding uh, the and participating in the protection of our assets from foreign intrusion that I knew about before. And uh, it is certainly important that we continue that. Uh, the threats from abroad now are so multiple and happening every day. Uh, not the least of which are the cyber threats as well. And that is a daily concern. Yes, sir. And I, I look forward to continuing this conversation, hopefully offline. I think uh, we have to do everything we can to make sure that whatever we are funding at the federal level, whether that's at the universities or, or at NASA, uh, is not being appropriate and then moved over uh, to our foreign competitors. Uh, and with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowman of New York. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and, and thank you, Administrator Nelson, for your testimony today. Uh, as you just discussed with Representative Bonamici, the work that NASA does is so important in capturing the imaginations of our young people. 
I saw it all the time as an educator where I spent uh, 20 years of my career before coming to Congress. Uh, and I continue to see it in Congress. In fact, I just heard from a rising high school senior in my district named Nathaniel, who talked about how important it is for him to him that NASA has an adequate R&D budget. He wants to make sure we're staying on track to get to Mars and asked me to think of the students who may become the next generation of aerospace engineers. Can you tell us a little bit more about your approach to expanding NASA's STEM engagement work? How do we make sure that we're reaching out to students like Nathaniel in every community, including marginalized communities and nurturing their aspirations? Yes, sir, Congressman. Uh, right off the bat, the president's uh, budget is a robust increase in STEM. And this particular public servant, joined by Pam and Bob, uh, have this as one of our main drivers because of the value to our country. It's the value to our agency as well. Uh, we have a very highly educated uh, agency. Uh, we are, then an extension of your question, we are constantly out looking for diversity as well. Uh, I want to commend to your attention uh, a, a good example of that that occurred in the past. As you came out of Mercury and Gemini and Apollo, almost all those astronauts were white men test pilots. But coming along with the space shuttle, you didn't need to have test pilots for every astronaut position. And NASA actually went with a lady who advised them how to go about and recruit women and minorities. Her name is Nichelle Nichols, and she was the actress that played Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. And as a result, the African-American community had a tremendous identification with her. And as NASA was recruiting astronauts for the space shuttle program, she reached out to the minority uh, institutions, the HBCUs, to women, and that first class of space shuttle astronauts, 1978, was suddenly an astronaut class that looked very diverse, especially compared to the previous test pilots. Uh, and it was successful. Mm -hmm. And so we are now extending that. And I can go into the detail on that uh, further if you'd like. Well, 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 not at this time, but I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I really want to encourage uh, you to, to think younger. Um, you know, we have kids who uh, African-Americans uh, and Latinos and people of color uh, dreaming about being astronauts in, in places in my district like the Bronx and Mount Vernon uh, and Yonkers. And <clears throat> if we begin to think of STEM uh, uh, through the lens of beginning in middle school, uh, from grade six through 12 and, and putting kids on a pathway beginning at that time, I, I think that that would that would be tremendous. And, and please target Title I schools uh, and the communities that surround them. I think you would get a uh, great diversity uh, there. Um, I have one quick uh, last question, uh, Mr. Administrator. Uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, NASA's work with private contractors? Uh, we got to the moon uh, without private contractors, if, if I'm not mistaken. And now it seems like a lot of things are being contracted out to private private institutions like SpaceX. Can you talk about just, just sort of the buy, balance there and reliance on private contractors versus uh, NASA uh, continuing to serve as a, as a public good, if you will? In the Apollo program, Mr. Congressman, we got to the moon with American corporations. Uh, they did all the work. NASA supervised. NASA had a reason to supervise it because NASA's responsibility is to make sure that it is safe, particularly when you put humans strapped into all of that explosive potential. 
And uh, we're just continuing it in a different way. Now, why, are it, why is it a different way? Well, back in uh, 2010, I had the privilege in a bipartisan way with Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson of NASA was kind of at a, at a dead still, not knowing where it was going. And we said we ought to have a NASA program, a government program, but we also ought to have a commercial program and it ought to be dual track. And that was the NASA bill of 2010 that was passed unanimously in the Senate and it was passed in the House by a three quarters vote. And uh, that's the track that we're on. You see that already implemented that we now have a commercial carriers of both cargo and crew to the International Space Station. That has been going on for years now. Now we're going to have a blending of the government and the commercial as we go back to the moon and eventually as we continue out into the cosmos. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, uh, Thank you, Administrator, for being here today. Over here, sir. <laughs> right. There you are. There we there go. You are. All right. Hey, I just want to talk to you for a moment about um, the growing and very concerning Chinese dominance in space. As I'm sure you know, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is openly talking about replacing the United States as a preeminent space power. They've launched more rockets and satellites into space last year than the rest of the world combined including the United States. They just manned its space station, brand spanking new, uh, and uh, openly talking about replacing the International Space Station, 10,000 satellite constellation, they're on track, an agreement with Russia to put a, uh, to put a research station on the moon, growing anti-satellite capabilities. Would you agree that we, the United States, cannot continue to be number one on Earth if we're number two in space? First of all, Congressman from Florida, thank you. Thank you for your representation. The United States ought to be preeminent in space. We, I couldn't, I, I, just in the interest of time, I, I couldn't agree more. That's what has me scratching my head of why we have a half billion dollar cut. Uh, in the president's proposed NASA budget, a three seventy-five uh, percent cut to the Human Lander Center to the uh, to the Human Landing System. Excuse me. Have you spoken with the vice president about when her first meeting with the National Space Council will occur? Do you know when that's going to occur? May I answer your former question yes, first? Absolutely. Uh, we have a uh, six point four percent increase in the overall NASA budget. And the cut to which you refer uh, is a result of the Congress making the decision uh, that the request was for the Artemis program $3.4 billion in last year's, uh, in this current year's uh, uh, budget. Uh, and you didn't give 3.4, the appropriation was 850 million. So given the eggs that I'm presented in the basket, I'm trying to get us there and get us there quick. And so uh, I have said earlier in the hearing that there are more ways to do it. If you all are considering a jobs bill, uh, there's an R&D component of the jobs bill as well as infrastructure. And it would uh, be very, very helpful if you could uh, consider those increases. Absolutely. I think you'll certainly see support uh, from this foxhole. We have to put the first American woman and the next American man on the moon. Uh, and to do that, we need a viable landing uh, uh, system. So I certainly think you'll see the support in this committee. Fight will be ongoing with the appropriators, but I I want to uh, see NASA support uh, for that for that as well. And yes, and then, Congressman, I have spoken to the Vice President 
Uh, and I look forward to her leadership in the council. I'll be meeting with her next week. And uh, I expect that as the NASA administrator that I will take a very active role on the National Space Council. Mr. Administrator, do you support the Wolf Amendment, uh, which as you know, prohibits bilateral cooperation with the National Space Council, uh, including NASA, China, with China, Chinese owned uh, companies. Do you support sustaining the Wolf Amendment? And if so, making it permanent? It is the law and I support it. That is fantastic to hear. And finally, um, do you support making it permanent? Mr. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, that doesn't mean that we can't find areas of cooperation. Uh, and those areas are deconfliction of space assets running into each other, uh, trying to get them to participate in getting rid of all that space junk. Uh, that's why I was very uh, rather abrupt uh, in my comments about when they had the return of a whole big rocket and it wasn't controlled uh, and it threatened populations. Now, fortunately, it ended up falling in the Indian Ocean, but it could have fell in Europe or uh, somewhere in the Middle East. So uh, I have been very harsh in my commentary about uh, the Chinese not doing those kind of things, including the space debris. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield my time. Thank you very much. Chair Neil recognize our newest member, Ms. Sandberg. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Ranking Member, and to all my colleagues. It's truly an honor to be here to serve on this committee with you all. Thank you for allowing me to serve. And I'm especially excited and honored to be able to be here today with our administrator slash senator. Um, and also, I wanted to say as a former federal employee, thank you to NASA employees, staff and researchers for the important work that you do. Um, we so appreciate you. Um, NASA's work is critical, of course, not only to taking us to the far reaches of space, but also for understanding our planet here at home, and particularly our understanding of our planetary systems and climate change and how that's transforming our communities. And in New Mexico, my home state, that, of course, is being manifest in terms of chronic drought, extreme fires, and really an uncertain future. And so I am tremendously um, excited to see the increases for the Earth Sciences Program and NASA in this budget because I think they're extremely important. But NASA, Madam Chairwoman, is also extremely important as an economic engine for all of our states, and particularly in New Mexico, where we have a very large aerospace industry that is growing daily and that we are working working hard to grow, and is a powerhouse in its own right in, in aerospace. Also, of course, NASA is a leader in advancing research and innovation and American competitiveness in general, and in growing our STEM workforce. And I believe, Madam Chairwoman, that we are at a critical inflection point in our country, in our history, and in our future in restoring science to its proper place and in informing our decision-making in growing and diversifying our STEM workforce and our economy, and in deploying science to tackle our biggest challenges, especially in global climate change. And so, Madam Chair, Mr. Administrator, my question is really focused on NASA's view of our home planet and particularly the role that NASA plays in climate change. Um, Madam Chair mentioned in her opening that I'm a former employee of OMB, and one of my duties there was actually working on the Landsat program, and one of the significant tensions that we always found with NASA's budget was in balancing the space missions and the Earth-based missions that uh, NASA has. And so, as I said, I was very pleased to see the increase in Earth sciences. And so, Mr. Administrator, I'd like to hear more about how you see NASA's role in the earth sciences and advancing our understanding of climate change and how that fits into the Biden administration's overall climate science agenda. There is a $300 million increase in science in this NASA budget. Earth science is a major part of that. Uh, that, uh, in addition to the present uh, unbelievable instruments that we have up in orbit, 
uh, measuring very precisely what is happening to the Earth's climate. Uh, it was just announced that we are going to put up a series of five great observatories over the course of the next decade. The first is a joint one with India that will occur uh, in January of next year. Uh, and these five great observatories are all going to collate their information and talk to each other in a 3D dimension of what's happening to our Earth by looking at land, water, ice, and the atmosphere. That is going to bring us a new dimension of information in addition to our very precise instruments that are remotely sensing what's happening on the earth. So uh, the scientific world is quite excited about not only what's happening in planetary science as we project out, but what we are doing with regard to understanding what is happening here, our own planet. Thank you. And Madam Chairwoman and, and Mr. Administrator, um, in the interest of time, I would just like to also echo many of the words that we heard today about diversifying our STEM workforce and our aerospace workforce. Um, a recent study issued by this committee showed that the ratio of men to women in aerospace and that NASA is still three to one and persons of color um, are still outnumbered three to one in our federal workforce in this um, in this space as well. And I think it's critical that we get more women and people of color serving in our federal agencies and in the industry. And with that, thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, may I just uh, point out that uh, the next two uh, Senate confirmed positions in NASA, the deputy, Pam Melroy, and the CFO, uh, Margaret Vo Schaus, is uh, both uh, female. Thank you very much. Mr. Baird. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everyone, and thank you, Ranking Member Lucas, uh, as well as Administrator Nelson, we really appreciate you being here and participating in this meeting. You know, I'm fortunate enough to have Purdue University in my district. It has a strong history of educating astronauts uh, and producing scientists and engineers that work at NASA. Uh, so it is, um, as you mentioned earlier, it is extremely important that the United States remain a leader in science and innovation, particularly in space. As China and Russia team up and build their space programs, the necessity to remain competitive has also become a point of national security. So I would like to, I'd like to go to Russia first. Um, they've indicated that they may withdraw from the International Space Station Partnership uh, if sanctions are not lifted against that nation. Uh, you recently had a conversation with Dmitry Rogozin, uh, the director of the General Ro Ro Cosmo. Uh, and the Russian Space Agency. Uh, so I'm, my questions are, do you really believe or do you feel that Russia will remain in the International Space Station if these sanctions are not lifted? A second question, uh, do you have any idea what the cost to operate the International Space Station might be? And then uh, in the final years of the Russian MIR station, efforts were made to privatize the platform uh, what would prevent Russia from privatizing their segment of the International Space Station? So, Congressman, comment. thank you for that question. I want to address it comprehensively. Uh, first of all, you said you represent Purdue. Uh, Purdue, back in my day, produced almost as many astronauts as did the U.S. Naval Academy. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it hadn't surpassed all other universities. We appreciate that recognition. Thank you, sir. I have had three conversations with Dmitry Rogozin uh, last week. Uh, I was quite concerned, as you have expressed in your question, uh, was there, uh, because of these comments that were coming out of Russia, were they going to uh, about face and, and break the partnership that we've had with Russia 
when it was the Soviet Union in 1975, when an American spacecraft and a Russia and a Soviet spacecraft rendezvoused and docked, and they lived together for nine days in space. And we've had that cooperation ever since. And it's very evident on the International Space Station because there's always a Russian crew, there's always an American crew on board. So the first indication was actually in the NBC interview of President Putin when he spoke glowingly about, and that came a day after I had my first conversation with Rigoz, and Putin spoke glowingly about the cooperation in space, particularly on the space station. So in the second conversation with Rigozin, he confirmed that. And in the third conversation, we had actually participated, I virtually, on a panel, uh, international panel, that they were having the conference in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, we had additional information from that com conference that confirmed what we were seeing. And then the final thing is, uh, they're getting ready in just a couple of months to put up a major, another major Russian component to the space station. So why would they be doing that and just a few years going to abandon it? It didn't make sense. And so uh, I have a much changed uh, attitude about, I think uh, we are going to see the co continued cooperation. However, your question is further. What about Russia and China teaming up? And I think uh, we've got to watch that. I, I think, uh, as I said in my opening comments, uh, China is very aggressive in its uh, Chinese government space program. And as a result, uh, we've got to be concerned about that. Uh, and if Russia is giving them a lot of their technology on rockets, uh, uh, that's something we got to be concerned about. And, and they're talking about going to the South Pole of the moon, and that's where the water is, the water ice. So, uh, indeed, thank you for raising that, Congressman. Thank you for your response. Appreciate it very much. And I yield back. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Mr. Administrator, good to see you. Yes, sir. Um, I don't want you to forget about the University of Colorado that has produced a lot of astronauts as well. Very I true. So, um, obviously, you've been involved with a lot more appropriations than I have over the years, but I think the challenge, the competition with China, potentially Russia, uh, offers us some uh, opportunities. Uh, not to really mix civilian and military, but to find some other pockets that might want to support our space program and, and all the phases of it. So, you know, for me, I, I don't want to see this as a zero-sum game, that human exploration takes from Earth science and Earth science takes from planetary science and everything takes away from heliophysics. Um, and I do think the fact that there is some serious competition now, uh, we'll give you a lot of opportunities, and I just want to raise my hand. I'm, I, I'd be willing to work with armed services or anybody else to help you have the budgets that will allow us to be preeminent, uh, continue to be preeminent in the space program, because I already gave you one of these bumper stickers, and this committee, I drive them crazy because I talk about getting our astronauts Amen. to Mars. Amen. <laughs> Um, getting our astronauts to Mars by 2033. And as you said, the orbital mechanics make that a very good time to do it, saves a lot of travel time. So can you explain to us how you see the Artemis program helping facilitate us getting to Mars by 2033 or in that time frame? Congressman, I don't think the United States wants to be second in anything. And although we were on the surface 
of the moon about 55 years ago. Uh, we said we're going back, and it is part of a greater mission to go further, and that's to Mars. Uh, but mindful that we are seeing competitors that are being very aggressive. Uh, that, I think, is going to create the juices flowing. And I believe competition is always good. And uh, that means we better be trained and disciplined and ready. So you've mentioned, and I think you've uh, answered it in a couple questions, um, having uh, NASA, in effect, participate in the infrastructure bill, that it be part of the jobs plan or something. How, how do you see, uh, and, and I agree with you, by the way, uh, how do you see uh, NASA fitting into, say, an infrastructure plan? NASA, at a minimum, has $5.4 billion of desperate infrastructure needs. The building down at Michoud, which is a part of the Marshall Space Center, but this located in uh, New Orleans, that's where we're assembling the first stage of the SLS rocket. The building has holes in the roof. <laughs> And so it's emblematic of infrastructure that has not, and it's not just NASA, it's everything. Look at the roads and the bridges. NASA has a need for that. And if you all do a jobs bill, I hope you would consider NASA in that jobs bill. And I think you're gonna find this committee, uh, despite them, you know, me making them all crazy with some of the things I have to say, we work very well together. And I think you're going to get a lot of support from us, uh, both sides of the aisle, in whether it's an infrastructure issue or, you know, putting the building blocks into place to get to Mars. Let me ask you one last question, uh, heliophysics. So we passed a space weather bill signed by President Trump last year, um, I was a little bit disappointed to see sort of the heliophysics part of the budget uh, reduced uh, in this year, just as we're getting this new legislation in place um, and would like to see that plussed up in some fashion or another. Any comment? But that heliophysics is part of a budget that was increased by 300 million. That's the science part of the budget. And planetary science... Uh, is a big part of that. And we've got to understand a lot of the stuff on heliophysics because when we send astronauts back to the moon, you have a solar explosion on the moon and all that radiation's coming. We've got to have a way to know in advance, well in advance, to save our astronauts that they don't get fried. Same thing on the long trip to Mars. We've got to be able to understand what's coming. And, and on Earth climate science, we need to better understand the effects of the sun with regard to delicate measurements of our climate in order to be better stewards of our planet. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Thanks, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Sessions. Chairwoman, thank you very much. Uh, Administrator, thank you for taking time to be with this important committee. I want to thank uh, the leadership of this committee, not only gentlewoman from, from Dallas, but also Mr. Lucas for their leadership. Uh, sir, there is a big discussion about jobs, a big discussion about need of jobs. Is there pending uh, the uh, agree or the final decision by GAO. Is there a document or something that's going to be released from you that will lay out uh, perhaps, I don't know about a visionary statement, but the thinking of NASA about moving forward? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know that I can pinpoint it to how many jobs it's going to be. Uh, we can look into the past of NASA. We can tell you, uh, how much money has rippled through the economy as a result of the space program, 
how much money on a specific part of the space program has rippled through the money and give you an estimate in the past of the jobs that were created. We, yes, cl we clearly know that that's the case, uh, particularly when you're doing cutting edge technology and you're developing new things and suddenly you got a whole new line of employment. Uh, and that's going to occur as we uh, develop the technology to go to the moon and Mars. Yes, sir. Let me move away from perhaps the word jobs and go to the to the word document. Is there a document that you're waiting to produce to release that in essence, I, I think would provide some specificity towards NASA's thinking about what they're talking about, of not just competition, but actually what would be on the moon, how they might move forward. Is there a document which you're preparing that would be available soon after the GAO decision? We'll prepare that document once we know what the path is forward as a result of the GAO decision. Okay. And that's where it then comes to the word jobs. Uh, you and I both know uh, we have Blue Origin, we have uh, Boeing, we have Lockheed Martin, we have back in the district that I represent in Central Texas, McGregor, Texas, SpaceX. There are a lot of people in this area. Uh, I would say to you that uh, I find intriguing and, and really essential the thinking of this administration through your service, sir, about what that future looks like. Because I think that that the development of, of jobs has a lot to do with uh, the ability that a company has to know, not just of the funding, but of the strength of these missions uh, to, to have long-term employment, to have long-term uh, decisions about what kind of people they have employed. I spent a few years at a old organization that changed names a number of times, but essentially it was Bell Labs. And the Bell Labs needed to know about their where they were headed to, to where they could make longer term decisions. And I would say to you that uh, I, I think that your uh, mark on that vision statement about what would be competition, what would be uh where we're going to land, what, where we're going to put a space station up, whether we're going to put something on the surface and, and playing that out. I think you've indicated you've got a pretty good handle on that. NASA has an idea about where they want to go and the specificity of that when, when available will enable these companies like SpaceX and others to then make a determination about where they're going to head not just with jobs, but how they're going to recruit, how they're going to retain. Uh, and as you know, there's a very aggressive schedule of flights and, and, and moving forward. And I think that is part of the vision statement. It's a, it's a joint uh, exercise that you're doing, public-private partnership, so to speak, uh, but with the vision of NASA. So I, I really want to thank you. I, I remember back to Dan Golden very well. And Mary Ellen Weber, who was one of his favorite astronauts, uh, Jim Bridenstine, I think did a great job as Dan Golden did. And I think you stand uh, at that doorway of being able to give a, a great vision and statement. But I would say back to you, these companies that uh, have these uh, leading edge scientists need that viewpoint. And so do you, last question, what, what do you think about timeframes uh, of that release? Uh, shortly after the uh, GAO decision and Congressman further, I would say that the past is prologue. Look what happened to the jobs in this country in the field of STEM as a result of the Apollo program, where a major goal was set and the nation decided collectively, the whole of government, the, the whole of American uh, free enterprise, that we were going to accomplish that goal and look at the jobs that came out of that, that then revolutionized things. Look at the micro uh, technology that came when you had to develop small in size, low in weight, 
and highly reliable instruments for the Apollo program. And look what that did, everything from watches to computers. Uh, and we're seeing that today, and you'll see more of that uh, as we get on down the road on going back to the moon and on to Mars, as well as all these other things in science that we've been talking about. Administrator, thank you. Everyone else has had a chance to put in a plug. I, too, would like to have you come to uh, Waco, Texas, and visit McGregor, Texas, where SpaceX is. Uh, I think you'll you'll be, once again, uh, reinvigorated by the free enterprise system of, of bright people. And I want to thank you for your service, not, you know, not just the United States House and the Senate, but also your service now. And, and good luck and Godspeed. I think we will salute to a great plan. And thank you. I yield back my time, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. His invitation to Waco will only follow one to Dallas. Miss uh, um, Moore. Mr. Foster. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, um, well, uh, first, uh, thank you, Ranking Member Lucas, uh, Administrator Nelson, for joining us here today. Um, I believe the documents that my Republican colleague, Mr. Sessions, was requesting are known as the Technical Design Report and a resource-loaded schedule and budget, will, which will be required for the Artemis mission, the Gateway Project, and the mission to Mars. Uh, when can we in Congress expect a preliminary version of these documents? After the GAO report. So within the year, by the end of the year? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, you also mentioned in your remarks the importance of developing new technology uh, as part of the, the realistic uh, ways of getting to Mars. Um, you know, also you mentioned the, uh, the very difficult problem of radiation shielding for which, you know, it's for both the mission to Mars and the Gateway Project, which I believe there aren't really satisfactory solutions yet. Um, a part of which is to make very high performance propulsion systems so you can get to Mars and back quickly. Now, um, the National Academies recently released a report, um, I think in February of this year, entitled Space Nuclear Propulsion for Human Mars Exploration, which looks at a lot of the technical details for really um, you know, getting a higher performance uh, mission to Mars, propulsion system for the mission to Mars. Um, and it recommended that if you're in order to support human missions to Mars as soon as, well, they were planning on the late 2030s, uh, that NASA needed to invest money now in a very aggressive technology development uh, program for the propulsion that addresses the fundamental challenges, both for thermal, nuclear, and electric nuclear propulsion. Uh, Congress has uh, maintained an interest in, in space nuclear power and propulsion. Uh, through both the authorization and appropriation language, including $110 million in the FY 2021 appropriation. Um, could you comment on why NASA's FY 2022 budget uh, does not propose any funding for either nuclear electric propulsion or nuclear thermal propulsion technology development and demonstration activities? Congressman, it's going to have to in the near future. Uh, because the alternative is to go to Mars with conventional technology, uh, which is going to take us eight to 10 months to get there. And then you're going to have to be on the surface for two years uh, before you would bring the crew back for another eight to 10 months. And that's because of the alignment of the planets so that you could get back in that shorter period of time. So, is it realistic that you could send a crew all the way to Mars and sustain them on that distance of millions and millions of miles? I think my personal opinion is, now I am not a scientist, so we're gonna have to uh, listen to the propulsion folks, but, uh, my country boy understanding of this is that we are going to have to speed up one way or another, try at least to get it down to a year on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can do that with one of those nuclear 
I think it's nuclear thermal. Yeah, nuclear thermal. That 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 the, my physicist understanding is that it's nuclear thermal, and um, that the uh, that the new, that the solar uh, options will be mainly useful for getting cargo there um, with low mass into low Earth orbit. Um, but but I'm really um, you know I would have expected a more aggressive uh, budget proposal if that's going to be a serious option. Uh, you know one of the very positive things that's happened. Um, is that there seems to be a, a convergence on the use of low enriched uranium uh, for these missions, now, because there had been previous discussion both for surface power reactors and propulsion reactors on using high enriched uranium. This is, uh, to my mind, a very dangerous future where, um, where multiple countries will have large amounts of weapons usable uranium as part of their propulsion reactors because of the ease of which they could be converted to nuclear weapons. And the world and space will be much safer if we standardize on that. It's been a, uh, it's been a real step forward, I think, for the world that we're focusing on the low enriched uranium designs for, for both the surface and the propulsion reactors. But I urge you to really um, you know, give that uh, program a healthy kick because it's going to be essential to get the performance we need for a Mars mission on the schedule, we hope to see it happen. Congressman, you obviously uh, are skilled in this very technical area. And I might say, I think you're correct that we're not going to be handling a lot of highly enriched uranium because it's very important in another part of our government that that doesn't get out of our control and into somebody's hands who can use it to build a bomb. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. And the advanced nuclear reactor concepts for that are look, being looked at for commercialization are also moving towards high enriched, uh, uh, low enriched, high assay uh, material, which is much safer. And so I think the convergence of NASA and the commercial reactor world is a very pos positive trend that we should encourage. Uh, and my time is nuclear up. Uh, electric, uh, Congressman, uh, offers new possibilities. We're just not there yet. Uh, yeah. You could develop a rocket like uh, one that's being experimented on, Vasimir. It'd get us there in 39 days. It'd go accelerate halfway and deaccelerate the remaining half. Once you're there in 39 days, the planets don't get out of alignment. and you can stay a week or two, a month, and you can sprint back 39 days. But the technologies are not there. These are the things that we're going to have to develop before we end up with the technology we're going with in the 2030s to Mars with humans. Thank you. And I'm, I'm over time and I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Lucas uh, for, for both of uh, your leadership uh, and partnership on this. Administrator, it's good to see you again, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, when we last spoke, uh, well, first of all, let me commend the, the achievements from last year. I mean, uh, to be able to land on, uh, send, send the Mars uh, missions up, uh, launch Americans uh, from American soil and American-made hardware, uh, and to uh, uh, have SpaceX uh, recover safely 26 flights in one year, which is about three times what the space shuttle was able to do in one year during its best years is, is a massive achievement in any year, but especially during a pandemic. Uh, I think we have proven out the, the, the government and commercial partnership um, uh, aspects and the model works. Uh, I think we need to figure out how to continue to accelerate that, incentivize industry, keep industry uh, interested in these programs and, and not uh, grind them to a halt on contracting issues. Uh, to that point, uh, you know, I, I hope that is something that NASA is looking at is how do we get folks on contract quicker? How do we maintain um, fixed price incentive fee contracting rather than uh, cost plus incentive fee type contracts? Uh, there's a lot of ways, a lot of ways to skin a cat, but as you know, there's a lot of ways to kill programs, and and these are these are the the barriers to entry that uh, we sometimes see on the on the defense side. Uh, I want to just put a bow real quick on the, the HLS conversation. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion. The problem that we have with the August 4th decision is that between now and then, we're actually going through markups within the Appropriations Committee that I sit on as well. So 
I just want to, to put a bow on the acquisition strategy. You mentioned in the, uh, the approps conversations a couple of weeks ago uh, that, that this first HLS award was effectively a one-off demonstrator for the first mission. You use the word demonstrator again today. Uh, the inference of that would be that th there are follow-on competitions and that represents effectively your acquisition strategy. Uh, but that's not reflected either in the FY22 budget request nor the five-year plan. Uh, and so just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, because there really is only two scenarios coming out of August 4th, either the, the protest is upheld or it's not. If it's upheld, uh, we still have a massive funding gap to the tune of $5.4 billion. That, your plan is to use the JOBS Act to get healthy enough either directly or indirectly through other programs to pay for the follow-on HLS programs? Well, that's up to you. That's up to you if you decide to appropriate the money in order to have these follow-on competitions and many landings one a year over, over a decade. And by the way, they will be fixed price. Good. Okay. Fixed price contracts. Good. I just want to make sure that that ask is on the table and that and that not only the authorizers, but the appropriators are aware that that is uh, the plan to get whole on this overarching uh, acquisition strategy. And if that's the case, uh, that we need to codify that as we move through the next couple of weeks before August 4th. Uh, I resonate with the competition is good. Um, we, we need to keep keep pushing in that direction. And I think NASA is doing a good job of that. Uh, more horses in the race is always good. Uh, I want to dive down into a couple of specific programs as well, if you, if you don't mind, Administrator. Uh, the Mars sample recovery, uh, you mentioned early on that uh, that was still something we were chasing. Uh, we have the rover now on the planet. Uh, we have it uh, collecting samples here, uh, but we don't have necessarily the program of record or the funding to bring back the samples. Uh, that that could be a large bill. Um, where is that captured in the in the strategic plan or in the budget request? It's being designed right now. Okay. And as soon as we have, I've seen one concept. It's a very complicated concept. Uh, they want to make sure that the material is uh, not contaminated. Uh, once it comes back, all of this is done in a very elaborate uh, uh, instrument that they land on mm -hmm. Mars. Mm -hmm taking the sample that will be collected by this rover, Perseverance, transferring it to the other, preparing it, and then putting it in effect in a capsule that then launches from the surface of Mars and comes back and then comes back through with a heat shield through the entry of the atmosphere. Okay, so we're still characterizing the the, the price footprint of that of, of that design. Uh, yes, sir. It's going through design reviews, okay? Yes, sir. Last, in the remaining 10 seconds, we have a program in my district called SOFIA. This is a 747-based infrared uh, instrument, just uh, upgraded with a new instrumentation system recently, partnership with Germany, lots of money being spent on that. That's set to be terminated within this budget request. I would request that you Look at that, uh, at least wait for the senior review in FY22 before we make any decisions uh, and, and happy to support you in those conversations and host you in our district for that as well. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much, Ms. Moore. You're mooted. Thank you so very, very much, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Administrator, uh, for your, your patience. Uh, during this very long hearing. Um, Mr. Bowman raised a, a point and you didn't get a chance really to respond. Uh, you're putting 20 million extra dollars into STEM education and he proposed that it ought to start like at K-6. And I'm thinking maybe that's too old. Uh, and I just want to know specifically what you're doing to uh, to in the K-12 space, um, in particular regarding STEM education. I don't think if you give somebody their first slide rule <laughs> when they're a freshman in college, that you're going to um, um, do very much in terms of, of that space. I understand your concern, Congresswoman. I'm going to try to affect that because education doesn't start once you enter the university. It starts exactly. a lot earlier. And um, I think you will see that in addition to the STEM grants, which go to universities, 
I think you will see uh, us try to uh, expand the efforts of educating kids. We can only do with STEM grants what the law allows. However, we have other ways of getting this word into uh, even elementary and secondary schools. That, that's where they need to be. Um, Mr. Administrator, um, you have um, you've spent a lot of time talking about equity and gender equity. And what we've noticed on this committee is that not only were women in low level jobs like restaurants uh, suffering through this pandemic with the loss of job, but we noticed that uh, women published less papers than before um, the pandemic. Um, and I just want to know if there, um, can you tell us what the pandemic has done to NASA uh, in, uh, personnel? Well, fortunately, uh, our personnel were the first to be able of any government agency to adapt quickly uh, by remotely being able to work. Okay. Uh, we are governed uh, on a return uh, to the offices uh, by the decision of the White House, and we will be governed accordingly. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, I'm tired of roaming around in an empty headquarters building, uh, basically by myself, now joined with Pam and Bob, uh, so I'm looking forward for everybody getting back. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Administrator, um, I just want to point out that I'm from Wisconsin, so this is a long way from Florida. I know how much you admire Florida. Um, but a great example uh, of the partnership of NASA uh, is with the partnership that they have, the University of Wisconsin at Boeing partnered under the University Leadership Initiative and students got to study robotics, advanced aviation manufacturing, which I know you're interested in. Um, and uh, there's a lot of scientific inquiries regarding the Great Lakes system on the climate of the Eastern United States and even the science behind the formation of tornadoes. Um, do you anticipate having a bigger footprint in places like Wisconsin uh, during your tenure? Yes, ma'am. And I've been to Wisconsin. Uh, I went there with Tammy Baldwin, uh, not for NASA, uh, but for the U.S. Coast Guard. You've got a station there just south of Milwaukee. And um, I, if you'll invite me, uh, I'll be happy to come back. Consider yourself invited uh, and, because uh, we uh, there are, there's a great nexus between what we're doing. Um, and, 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 and NASA. So we'd be happy uh, to have you. So consider yourself invited. We'll follow up. And, and Madam Chair, I would yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Feenstra. Thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. Administrator uh, Nelson, I appreciate you taking the time today uh, to speak to our committee on NASA and the administration's fiscal year 2022 budget proposal. As you know, uh, China is a significant competitor in space exploration and efforts to militarize space. Last week, I introduced an amendment uh, to the NSF for the Future Act along with Congressman Waltz. It was added with bipartisan committee support during the markup. The amendment related to prohibiting participation in malign foreign talent recruitment programs, such as China's Thousand Talents Program. The question is, does NASA have an active program in place to assess employees from foreign influence or prohibit their participation in malign foreign talent recruitment programs? If we don't, we will. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. It's, it's so important. I think it's critical to our country that, that we focus on, uh, on uh, those uh, around uh, the communist world that have concerns about our country. Um, another question I have, moving on uh, to the issue of agriculture, the, the future of sustainable aviation fuel may provide a new market for biofuels produced in Iowa. Uh, looking at your budget, how does biofuels play out uh, in sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel and related research and development um, in your budget for FY 2022? 
the first A in NASA is aeronautics, and we're looking at all kinds of fuels. Uh, basically, NASA aviation has got to do our part in lessening the pollution of putting CO2 and methane up into the upper atmosphere. So we are getting ready to fly uh, a demonstrator on an all-electric aircraft coming up this year. And that's just one uh, trying to look at alternative fuels. Now, how the biofuels work into this, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I know before we've seen biofuels into the American automobile industry uh, because most of us are at least getting 10% uh, ethanol when we pump at the gas pump. Uh, uh, I know the Air Force in the past had had a program that was uh, going to be uh, directed at mostly biofuels. When you launch rockets, you've generally got to have something that's really got a kick. And usually that's something like kerosene or hydrogen or methane. Uh, uh, so... But getting back to aeronautics, we are doing that and doing it aggressively. Well, it's great to hear. Uh, relating to agriculture, NASA's Applied Sciences sciences, and, and NASA's Harvest Program work to advance the, the use of satellite observations to benefit agriculture and food, food security. Can you talk about NASA's budgeting to develop applications to assist precision, precision agriculture and provide data in support of agriculture and land use issues such as drought forecasting or floodplain mapping control? So I'm an old country boy. So as a matter of fact, I can even remember my grandfather plowing a mule. But think about today. The farmer gets in an air-conditioned tractor and he's got a GPS system, and it's telling him exactly how to furrow that row. Yep. Uh, now, what about all the scientific instruments that we have now that can examine the crops from space and see what's diseased? Or what about the ones that are going to be able to predict drought in the future to help the farmer? Or what about the desert community that suddenly under the soil of the desert, we can locate deposits of water? All of those things are bound to be helping uh, agriculture and, and, and country folks. And uh, I think it's exciting. Yeah, uh, I do too. And Administrator Nelson, I greatly appreciate listening to you today. It's an honor and a privilege for a farm kid in Iowa to listen to you. Uh, and uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Letourneau. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. Administrator Nelson, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, get to interact with you today. Of your many accomplishments, my favorite is that you're a fellow former state treasurer. Uh, so it's um, it's great to see you here today. Um, now that the commercial crew program is fully underway, NASA will have the ability to add additional crew members to the ISS. How will NASA and International Partners crew time be impacted by the private astronaut mission? Well, uh, I think that's a concern, and I think we constantly have to monitor that. And what I have suggested uh, as a newbie but one who is responsible uh, is that uh, they have the same training that our professional astronauts have. Uh, they go through the same medical checks, uh, the same kind of psychological checks, uh, and that you have an experienced astronaut with them. Thus, you see that the company that's going to do the first uh, private astronauts to the space station uh, has uh, Michael Lopez Alegria, one of our very experienced astronauts that is conducting the training. They're even going out in the desert for like a week in order to 
create the the bonding of a crew. Uh, and uh, uh, they have also uh, named Peggy Whitson, who has spent more time in space than anybody else at some 800 plus days, uh, is going to be the astronaut that will accompany the second group that's much further on out. Uh, so you raise a very valid concern, and I've been trying to address that. I appreciate that. Uh, NASA continues to propose transferring specific space communication efforts over to the private sector. What progress has NASA made on this front? On which front? On, on transferring specific space communication efforts over to the private sector. I'm, I'm curious about the progress you've made and also the, the response that you've received from the private sector. Well, everything that really NASA does is the private sector. Uh, the, the private sector that you're referring to is the commercial part of spaceflight, where we give a, a, a request for proposal and companies come back and bid, uh, as we have done so successfully on commercial crew to the space station, as well as commercial cargo. Uh, those are fixed price contracts, but when it's involving humans, including the docking of cargo missions to the space station, NASA is going to be all over it to make sure that it, it's meeting the safety standards that we have to have on anything having to be with humans in space. Uh, does that answer your question? It does. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. And I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Ms. Oh, Ross. Is there uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, this is a wonderful hearing, Chairwoman Johnson, and thank you to Administrator Nelson for joining us today. I met you a couple times before, including in my home state of North Carolina. And as you know, North Carolina has contributed to NASA for decades. Christine Darden, one of NASA's hidden figures, broke barriers in the STEM industry and in gender and racial equality. And she's from North Carolina. She was the first African-American woman to be promoted into the senior executive service at NASA's Langley Research Center. We also have Christina Koch, Koch uh, three times graduate of NC State in my district, who served as a flight engineer on the International Space Station for three expeditions and set a record for the longest single space flight by a woman with a total of 328 days in space. And she was a participant in, an, in the all-woman spacewalk. And the 62 astronauts, including those on the Apollo 11 mission trained the University of North Carolina's Moorhead Planetarium. I believe that inspiring the next generation to reach for the stars well before they earn advanced degrees um, and qualified to join NASA is a crucial, crucial mission, both for Congress and for your agency. And in North Carolina and Research Triangle Park in particular, we're a major STEM education hub, and we've grown our STEM education at a higher rate than the national average. I'm thrilled to see that for the first time in many years, NASA's budget um, request includes a fund funding for its Office of STEM Engagement. And so I'd like to know how st the STEM engagement activities are building stronger ties with NASA's mission, including its flight programs. And uh, Mike Smith, uh, who gave his life for the country uh, in the terrible tragedy of Challenger, was from North Carolina as well. And um, thank you for the contributions from your state. STEM is, uh, we've had some discussion here already uh, extensively about the importance of STEM. Uh, you can't be a society that wants to do all of these gee whiz 
uh, technological achievements that are giant leaps uh, if you don't have the educated populace. And what better to stimulate the interest of kids uh, in science and technology and engineering and mathematics than the space program? Uh, and so we're going to really try to rev up STEM education. Uh, it got a big boost in the president's budget. Uh, and we're going to try to manage it in a way that it uh, really uh, does have an effect. STEM grants are not the province just of NASA. They're every agency of government. And you will have an opportunity as you go through these uh, authorization bills and appropriations bills coming on uh, to affect STEM throughout the whole of government. But we're going to try to do our part. Well, thank you so, so much. One of the other things that we do well in the Research Triangle is have a very innovative clean tech um, cluster and advancing clean energy. And can you elaborate on how your agencies work on research and work on climate change and innovation can uh, contribute to our domestic clean energy sector, including manufacturing and supply chains? Yes, ma'am. And uh, we've had uh, uh, considerable discussion on that issue as well. Uh, Climate science in NASA is getting a major emphasis, not only with the very uh, delicate instruments that are on orbit right now measuring all kinds of things, and you have seen the result, for example, in the National Weather Service. Well, NASA is the one that designs those instruments those satellites, those spacecraft, builds them and launches them, and NOAA then operates them. But we've got a future that is very exciting. Over the next decade, we are going to put up five great observatories, and they are going to give us a measurements of what's happening on land, on water, on ice and the atmosphere in a way that we've never had, and then collate all that into a three-dimensional understanding of the subtle changes that are occurring and what we need to do about that, as well as advise us on a daily basis of what we ought to be looking out for. All of that is around the corner. That's a two and a half billion dollar project over 10 years. Five missions, the first of which will be January of next year. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Menes. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, and, uh, and our ranking member, uh, Lucas. Um, Senator, um, Administrator, good to see you again. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator, uh, Administrator, do you think that uh, China is in a race to the moon with us? Yes, sir, Congressman. Why? Because of what they've already done and what they've announced they're going to do. And by the way, if you look back on the history of the Chinese program, they announce what they're going to do, and then they do it. And so uh, we've already seen they've been on the moon successfully. Uh, we clearly saw what they've done as only the second nation to ever be able to land a rover on Mars. We did so back in the 1970s and have had several since, but they're the second nation to be able to pull this off. And it's no minor feat. They are preparing a sample return mission from Mars. So this is demonstrating extreme capability. Uh, they've announced that they're going to send about three missions to the South Pole 
of Mars. We're sending three commercial probes overseen by NASA, all looking at water ice, because from that you can get fuel Correct. And, and oxygen. Right. So uh, I, I hate to interrupt you. I only have about three minutes. I have a couple other questions for you. Um, do we know that there's water ice on the South Pole? Yes, sir. Do we know how much there is on the South Pole? That's why we're going. Okay. And so that if you have if you have water ice in the South Pole, then you can create fuel, which then you can take off from uh, the, the, the moon a lot more efficiently than taking off from the Earth. And that's why you want to get the want to, want to get there. What happens if the United States and China arrive or somebody's there at the South Pole already and somebody else comes there? Who owns who gets that water ice? Well, uh, I think you raise a, a good question. And uh, that's why we have something known as the Artemis Accords, of which we are getting uh, other nations to sign it, uh, Brazil being the, the most recent. And what the Artemis Accords say is that our exploration of the moon is going to be transparent. It's going to be peaceful. Nations are going to cooperate together. And there's nobody going to be exclusive. Has China signed that? No, neither has Russia. That's interesting. So it's a data point. Look, I, 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 I raised those questions. I, I knew the answers, but um, we are in a race with the Chinese to get to the moon. And it's a matter of national uh, security that we win that race. It's also a matter of national pride that we win that race just like it was back in the, in the 60s when we beat the Russians to the moon. Because it shows, it's a demonstration to the world of who is the preeminent power in the world. And it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, people don't understand that, but that's exactly what's going on. And so, you know, you'll find in me somebody who will, will fund or try to fund NASA to the greatest extent possible to make sure that we're the first ones back on the moon. Related to that, uh, the the lander that we just uh, that we just awarded the contract to. When do you expect delivery of the first lander? Well, that depends on what uh, GAO says on August the fourth. Well, if they say that there's going to be competition, then there's a ten billion dollar shortfall in your budget, right? Um, and that's up to you. Then we'll. Uh, We'll see, uh, and I've suggested here before you arrived that there are more ways to skin a cat than one, and uh, you're going to have a jobs bill in front of you that's got an R&D component, and that would be a good place. Well, I, you know, I, I agree with you that with all the trillions that are being bannered about, that we should spend some of that on uh, on NASA and uh, and assuring that that the United States uh, remains and will always remain the preeminent uh, force in space. Uh, look, uh, you go back in history, it was the countries that were exploring that were always the dominant countries. Um, and so we need to keep on exploring and we need to be the first and we need to be the first out there. And so, um, you know, I know my time is up and I, uh, I yield back, but again, uh, thank you for being here. And it was again, pleasure seeing you again, sir. America never wants to give up its DNA as explorers, adventurers, because always we've had a frontier, uh, and we've been successful in capturing that frontier. Now our frontier is up. Thank you very much. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, uh, or afternoon, I guess now, uh, Administrator Nelson, thank you for being here. And, and uh, let me just say this, thank you for uh, the various forms that your service to this country have taken. Uh, it's very much appreciated and I'm thrilled that you're in the position you're in right now. Um, I'd like to, to talk to you a bit about NASA's Earth Sciences Division, specifically the Earth Applied Sciences Develop Program. I understand the program has worked with the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative for a number of years on projects designed to protect the Great Lakes. I come from Michigan. Uh, the Great Lakes are our lifeblood. It literally outlines our boundaries. It defines who we are as a state. Uh, the lakes are also critical 
to our livelihood. Uh, according to the Great Lakes Seaway Partnership, shipping on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway supported $35 billion in economic activity in 2017. So in my time in Congress, I've been working on this. I've introduced and passed legislation that prioritizes and uh, updates federal mapping of the Great Lakes. We talked, you know, you were just mentioning how uh, we have such a, an explorer uh, uh, character in our in our DNA, uh, we we continue to to need to uh, do more research and exploration even here at home. And the Great Lakes is one area where we can do that. I have uh, asked and, and passed legislation to prioritize the mapping of the Great Lakes. Um, introduced resolutions to oppose um, building nuclear waste repositories in the Great Lakes Basin. Introduced legislation to prevent Asian carp from reaching the lakes. Uh, continued robust funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. As you can see, this has been a priority. Uh, but the pressure on the Great Lakes as a result of climate change only raises the importance of research and work in preserving what is really an international treasure. So I wonder if you might uh, comment or discuss how the FY22 budget would continue uh, the work uh, that your agency is involved in, in preserving uh, the Great Lakes. Congressman, I had the privilege of serving with your dad, and it was a great privilege uh, to know him as a colleague. When you have these Earth observation satellites or spacecraft, they give us all kinds of measurements to address a number of the things that we also address terrestrially here. For example, the invasive species in uh, the Great Lakes. Uh, that is just a terrible um, boon to the existence of uh, marine uh, industry in the Great Lakes, that, that, uh, that kind of muscle that clogs up all the drains that comes in in the ballast water. You know, that's, that's one thing. But what about the algal balloons or other invasive species or stormwater runoff or uh, the, the, the coastal flood risk? the wetlands, all of those things, we can help the dangerous, uh, the dangers that are facing your constituents by the observations we are making from space. And uh, then that goes into what I had explained before about these five great observatories that are going to just refine that data and give it so much more comprehensive. So I'm with you, Congressman. I very much appreciate that. I mean, the, the agency obviously has a lot on its plate. And I will say that I do support your, uh, your goal of us continuing to lead in this space, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, but to not forget that the agency does have a robust agenda as it relates to uh, life right here on this planet. And I do appreciate your effort and particularly your continued support for uh, research related to the Great Lakes. It's a critical asset. And it's one that I'm happy to hear that you also appreciate and support. So with that, thank you again for your service to our country. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairwoman and Ranking Member. Thank you for holding this uh, hearing and Administrator Nelson, welcome. Um, thank you so much for being with us to uh, discuss the budget request for NASA. You know, back in February, I had the opportunity to go to JPL to witness the launching and the landing of Perseverance uh, rover. And that was quite an experience. And I was honored to be one of the few members that were able to uh, do that. Did you meet Mimi? She is the lady that handled the little helicopter. I don't think I personally had the opportunity to meet her. <laughs> but, you know, that was like, oh, my goodness. It was after 292 million mile and seven month preparation, right? So it was really, truly an amazing experience. 
um, during that uh, visit, what I did was as soon as I knew I was invited, I reached out to the uh, school districts in my district and Roland Unified School District invited the eighth graders to join me virtually. So I was able to take my laptop and turn it around and show the, um, the scale model of the rover. And that was quite an experience for the students. And I think that's exactly what we need to do to encourage our young students to take an interest in STEM related education and uh, provide the opportunities for them to uh, be encouraged to perhaps dream about being the next engineers, next scientists, and perhaps one of these days, they may be the ones taking on that uh, human lander and go back and retrieve the samples that our uh, astronauts are currently working on the MAR to bring back. And so I'm really excited uh, about that opportunity. And in my view, and I know you share this, uh, we need to keep our students engaged from an early age. And some of my colleagues on both sides before me talked about the importance of providing the opportunity, educational opportunities from early on, not when they are ready to go to college from pre-K to eight grades, which is why I'm so excited. And I want to give a plug in for my legislation that I introduced, Innovations in Informer STEM Learning Act. And this will create a, uh, a grant opportunity and also uh, allow uh, nonprofit organizations to give uh, you know, STEM related programs before, after, and even out of uh, school uh, programs. So I, you know, it's a good plug in for my colleagues, if they're not aware of it, to please sign on and become a co-sponsor of that bill. Uh, so can you please elaborate on how the additional $4 million the budget provides for the next generation STEM project will be utilized? And uh, obviously we can talk about the importance of uh, NASA supporting the type of uh, programming that my legislation will call for, um, for our pipeline of scientists, engineers, and astronauts, and so forth. First of all, thank you, Congresswoman. You have sat here the entire time. So thank you very much. Thank you for your interest. Uh, there's a $4 million increase that you mm -hmm. talked about, and it is for the emphasis on learning opportunities in K through 12. Awesome. I think we agree that uh, we need to ensure that today's students have the skills needed to join the STEM workforce, because this is the pathway for job creation which affects our American economy. And we are going to be ready to boost that nation's uh, challenges to, uh, you know, send, uh, I mean, to boost that nation's competitiveness uh, abroad. So thank you so much for that. And I know I've heard from many small contractors located in my district, which is California's 39th congressional district, about the importance of space exploration for the region that I represent. So I look forward to working with you with the committee uh, to ensure that our uh, space programs are appropriately funded. With that, obviously we understand. So it's not a question. I look forward to working with you and I will, I will yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Um, my first question I'm sure has not arisen um, in that because it relates to my district. Uh, the Zana Susana Field Lab was used during the Cold War and the early parts of the Cold War. Uh, various uh, contaminants, chiefly nuclear, remain. Uh, the facility, uh, or the, the acreage, is uh, immediately adjacent to the city limits of Los Angeles, surrounded by uh, populated suburbs. Uh, some 451 acres of this is a responsibility of uh, NASA. Uh, the adjoining property is uh, subject to uh, responsibility of the Department of Energy and uh, of the Boeing Corporation. Um, so the contamination affects uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, there are 700,000 people who have signed a signature demanding a full cleanup of the site. Uh, the uh, prior Secretary uh, of, the, of Energy, Governor Perry, uh, at my request, uh, made at a science committee hearing, visited the site, uh, and yet we still don't have any 
significant cleanup. A few uh, uh, old structures were removed. Um, I'd like to bring to your attention a documentary and uh, arrange to get it to you uh, called Dark of the Valley uh, about how hundreds of thousands of people are affected by this uh, contamination. Uh, I want to know whether I can count on NASA to work to comply with the consent decree and actually start cleaning up uh, the facility uh, relatively soon. Congressman, we take the environment very seriously. Uh, as to making a commitment to you, I've got to know the details, and I just simply don't have those. But I can say this. You can tell a lot about a fellow where he's going by where he's been and look at my environmental record over a lifetime of public service. And I think that'll give you some degree of comfort. We will get you fully briefed, and then we will get you uh, a copy of this documentary, which should be available soon. Um, um, you've noted that the uh, SLS uh, could be used uh, for multiple missions besides uh, sending humans to deep space. Can you discuss uh, your plan to keep uh, a regular cadence uh, for the SLS mission, uh, and uh, you have sp uh, spoke to my colleagues uh, on the national security of space using SLS, uh, uh, using the uh, Delta IV um, heavy, um, which is being retired. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, uh, ba basically on the Delta IV, uh, you're having the Atlas V and the Delta IV, which have been the mainstay workhorses of getting uh, a lot of commercial, but especially uh, uh, national defense payloads over time into orbit, into uh, protection of our country. And those are being replaced as we develop new rockets. And uh, uh, there is a specific timetable. I don't have that on the top of my head. Um, with regard to the regular cadence of landing on the moon with uh, Artemis, uh, that is what I hope is going to occur. Uh, if we can get a robust competition and have a decision on what the lander should be, and to have those landings once a year, so thus the cadence that you talk about, have them once a year over about a dozen year period, all of which is for the purpose of getting ready to go to Mars. Learning what we can, the preparation, the systems, the new technology, in, in dealing in an environment on a surface of a celestial body that is uh, one sixth the gravity, and we're getting ready to go to a celestial body that's one third the gravity of Earth. Thank you. I, I hope the chairwoman will allow me to sneak in one more question. Uh, can you share your perspective on how uh, the gateway is a critical element of our effort to further explore not only the moon, but ultimately expand our uh, space exploration to Mars? I won't go into the detail that I did before to spare the committee, but the gateway, in essence, is a small space station in lunar orbit that will do many things. It'll be a way station for us to go down and back from the lunar surface. It will be a research station. It's international. Uh, we've already got a number of partners, and it will be the place that is likely to be the embarkation point where we will assemble a spacecraft technology to be developed that will go to Mars. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Webster. Thank you, Chair. Senator, good to see you. I think you all have more Florida members on this committee than any other state, maybe outpaced by California. We got a big interest. <laughs> so do you. Um, I, I've been listening. I, I heard 
and it, it kind of expanded as we went along all of the amount of the information that you're gathering just from being in space, collecting data. And that certainly is useful data. I was wondering, how does NASA partner with other government agencies, even local and state agencies, to utilize that uh, from hurricanes in our area, but also there's wildfires, floods, and all kinds of other natural disasters. Uh, is there a way, or just tell me, how, what's going on right now with that? The extensive sharing of data among U.S. government agencies with NASA is just unbelievably. I, I didn't realize until I got into this position how extensive it is. Now, I'll give you a, a good example. We in Florida, of course, are concerned about the direction and the ferocity of an inbound hurricane. All right. You've got all these assets up there that are measuring all kinds of different items that affect the intensity and the direction of that hurricane. These are all, in large part, assets that are in space. We have the, the buoys on the ocean that help us, and, and we have airplanes that fly through and above the hurricane, but we've also got these assets in space that are giving us all kinds of new measurements. And that's just one example on the sharing of data. So uh, is there, is, we have, I was thinking about in Florida, we have, speaking of hurricanes, there are these uh, um, emergency operations centers all over, and uh, there's police and fire, and everybody has a, a lot of people have a seat at the table. If you're, and I'm sure you've been to one before, and they're all moving and working in pieces as, as some, so let's say, hurricane or some other disaster is coming. Um, are those pieces of information shared there, or can they be, or should they be? Uh, the data of yeah the data that they the, have so now this it's in action it's happening it's a live uh, storm and uh, these people are reacting locally to there's going to be a local flood or there's going to be a local windstorm problem of some kind uh is is that information shared even with those local eocs yes sir uh, and let me give you another example. Some of the uh, spacecraft that we have, for example, will measure the amount of moisture content in the atmosphere. And this is going to be even more evident in these great observatories that we're going to put up because measuring what's happening in the atmosphere. Now, moisture content of the atmosphere is a major component when we're trying to figure out what that hurricane is going to do in the future and the direction and the intensity and the, and the temperature of that atmosphere and the temperature of the surface of the ocean and even the temperature underneath the surface of the ocean. And a lot of that is coming from the very instruments that NASA has designed, built, and launched and then turned over to NOAA to operate. So that, yeah, I can see that. Uh, even the, the moisture content when it comes to flooding and other things, uh, because that's also a problem and aftermath. A lot of times the wind's already gone, the kind of the news story's already gone, and then our rivers feel, filled up, and later on, even sometimes a week, two weeks, three weeks later, is the surge of what happens. Uh, that's probably pretty awesome thing. <laughs> Well, I've learned something today. That's a lot more information than I even knew about. Thank you for coming. Congratulations on your new position. I know you do a fantastic job. We really appreciate you coming today. Thank Good you, to see Congress. you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Spice. Administrator Nelson, I have good news for you. I think I may be the last questioner of the well, afternoon. Well, you have been, ma'am, very, very patient. Well, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the chair and ranking member for uh, allowing us the opportunity to speak with you about the budget. 
first, I hail from the great state of Oklahoma, and there are some great NASA ties, including uh, your prede- or your um, yeah your predecessor, uh, who was from Oklahoma, as well as uh, General Thomas Stafford, who has a museum in Ranking Member Lucas's district. Who I saw yesterday, uh, Tom Stafford, a personal friend who lives uh, in Satellite Beach, uh, Congressman. And uh, I will see Jim Bridenstine for supper tonight. Well, tell him I said hello. Yes, ma'am. First, you mentioned earlier in the hearing that you were concerned about supply chain. And I am honored to be a member of the Supply Chain Task Force, which is looking at the critical infrastructure that has been impacted specifically over the last 18 months because of COVID-19, but also as it relates to the Department of Defense and what we can do as a country to ensure that we don't have any supply chain disruptions moving forward. And you specifically uh, mentioned rare earth minerals and uh, those come from foreign entities. And I think that we have to be mindful as we look to the future to figure out how do we prohibit um, the possibility of not having access to those, which is incredibly important to many of the things that we're doing at NASA, uh, as well as within the Department of Defense. That is something that I know the administration is also focused on, given their 100-day supply chain task force uh, memo that was put out a couple weeks ago. In addition, um, Congressman Waltz made the comment that he was concerned about China. And as a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I echo those concerns as well. I think hearing and seeing some of the things that uh, we have have seen over the last uh, couple of months, particularly with the landing of a rover on Mars, it, it's very clear that China is looking to outpace the United States. And it's imperative that we do everything that we can to invest Uh, in research and development, in exploration to ensure that that doesn't happen. In your your budget, you ask for $101 million for commercial low-Earth orbit development. And I very much appreciate the collaboration with the private sector uh, and NASA to do that. My concern is, how do we prevent another situation like we have seen with HLS? Because currently, we are on hold uh, with that particular program until the decision in August comes. And we're on a time frame here. And so my my fear is that we're doing a great job of investing in, in LEO, partnering with the private sector, but we cannot have delays. It is not in our best interest as a country. How do you help? How do you prevent that from happening in the future? Remember, there were delays on the commercial crew program. That was uh, contested as well. Uh, as it turns out, it's been a very uh, successful program. It's a fixed price contract. Uh, and the second uh, commercial provider for commercial crew is just getting ready to launch their vehicle at the end of next month. And then a crew on that vehicle at the end of the year. Uh, so uh, the law provides that someone can contest an award. And uh, we're not going to uh, be able to uh, avoid that. And we have indeed uh, had to go into neutral for the past 100 days uh, because of the bid protest. But this is our system. This is the rule of law. And uh, once we get a result, uh, we will move out as quickly as we can. And thank you for that answer. I appreciate uh, the fact that we do live under the rule of law in this country. The concern I have is that um, our adversaries don't pay attention to the laws of this country, and they're willing to uh, sacrifice to be able to move forward and advance at a very quick pace. So I think we as a country need to be mindful of how we navigate these waters in uh, signing these contracts and putting these private sector companies um, creating those partnerships with NASA so that we're not behind the eight ball. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing is to ensure the competitiveness of the United States. Well, remember, you're a big part of this. And all you have to do is look back at Apollo. And we were way behind. And the American people and the Congress supported uh, a young president's vision of going to 
the moon and back successfully within the decade, and it happened. And it was because everybody in the whole of government came together, supported by the American people. So as we are looking into this adventure that we are all joining in, you are very much a part of that. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Madam Chair, you'll back. Thank you very much. And thank you, Administrator Nelson, for being with us and spending this time answering all of the questions. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members and for any additional questions the committee may have or ask the witness. The witness is now excused and the hearing is adjourned.